So just to um, dive in and sort of show you the outline for today, um, first I'm going to spend some time on sort of the background of missing data and some essential tools and just sort of things we need to make sure we all sort of understand in terms of the framework. Um, and then we'll talk about ways of handling missing data. I'll first talk through sort of the wrong ways to do it um, and why those are not ideal. And then we'll go into better ways of handling missing data. Uh, again, with a, a focus on this multiple imputation approach and a particular type of multiple imputation called MICE, which is just particularly nice because it's, <laughs> MICE is nice, <laughs> um, because it's very flexible. Uh, it can work with big data sets and such. So I'll talk more about that later. Um, I'll have some conclusions. At the end of the slides, there's then a whole bunch of slides um, describing software for implementing MICE and um, tons of references for more information. We'll see how much time we have to get into those details. There's little snippets of code in the rest of the talk anyway, so you can get a sense for how to implement these methods. Um, and again, the references, I'll sort of highlight a few that I think might be particularly good places to turn from here if you want more information. One nice thing about missing data, actually, is that there are quite a few online tutorials or um, sort of other resources that, once you've gotten the basics today, um, might be good places to turn. So I'll just, again, I'll highlight those at the very end. Okay, so first, again, um, we can skip this course description, just sort of a, a general overview of what we're going to do, but I've just described that. Um, so the reason probably you're all on the call is that you know that missing data is common, um, especially if you have administrative data um, or sensitive surveys. Um, there are advanced methods to handle missing data, um, but what we're really going to and what we're really going to talk about today is how do we implement these methods and what are the implications for analyses um, if you do or don't use those methods. So just uh, to kind of reinforce why you should pay attention for the next two hours, you know, the short answer is basically because you can get the wrong answers if you don't handle missing data correctly. Um, you can lead to bias in your effect estimates, uh, or perhaps even if they are not biased, you might have incorrect standard errors. Um, and in fact, they're usually incorrect in a way that leads to results that are sort of more certain than they really should be, standard errors that are too small. Um, and again, we'll talk more about that. Okay, again, sort of just setting up um, the terms and the, the sources of missing data we're going to talk about, there's sort of two main types of missing data that we'll cover. Um, the first is what's called unit non-response. And this is a situation when you basically don't have any data at a given time point for, say, a particular person. Uh, okay, so the unit non-response, again, is a case where, for example, you had a list of people that you were trying to contact, um, either for an initial survey or perhaps a follow-up survey, and for some of those people, you just can't find them at all. So you don't have any data at that time point from them. Um, and so this is also called attrition in longitudinal settings where people attrit out of the sample. Oh, sorry. Um, unit non-response like this is... Um, What's called, a, it's what's called a, a fairly simple missing data pattern. Um, again, this sort of everyone, you have data or you don't have data. Um, and we can handle that using non-response weighting adjustments. And so I'm going to talk more later about what that means and, and how to do that. The other type of um, missing data is what's called item non-response. And that's a situation where, you know, someone, for example, started filling out a survey, but then they just didn't respond to some individual questions or they got tired at the end and just stopped answering any questions at, at a certain point. Um, and this type of missing data is usually handled um, using imputation approaches, and that's what I'll be um, talking more about. We're going to spend most of our time on the item non-response situation, um, but again, we will talk about weighting um, methods for unit non-response. Okay, but so before getting into the methods, um, the, the Really, the most important thing to think about when you have missing data is what led to that missing data. Um, we'll formalize this in a second, but the idea is um, what was the mechanism by which some values were missing and some were observed. 
you know, in sort of practical terms, there might be a few reasons. You might, again, you might have this attrition where some people move and you just can't find them anymore. Um, they, or maybe they go to jail and you, you don't know that they've gone to jail or you, um, you know, there could be various reasons that someone is no longer findable. Death is, of course, another reason that you might have unit non-response or attrition. Um, you might have data entry errors. So you might be doing your data analysis and there might be a value observed, but it might just be clearly wrong, um, sort of outside a potential possible real range. And so you might then treat that as missing because you realize, well, this can't possibly be correct. Um, and so there might be those sort of data entry errors. Um, there might be administrative data with missing values. You know, someone was supposed to fill out a whole form, but they just, you know, they didn't put down their social security. Well, they didn't put down their race, or they didn't sort of answer, or they didn't fill out the whole form. Another, which is probably becoming less common now with electronic um, surveys and such, but, you know, it's possible that some survey forms just get lost, that, you know, someone's walking down the street and a few pieces of paper fly away or they just, they're in a box somewhere and that box somehow gets lost. Um, again, hopefully that is less uh, common now with electronic surveys, um, but that sort of missingness can happen. That sort of, that would be sort of random and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, another reason might be someone, it's not just that someone kind of answers questions or not, but there might be particular questions that they really just don't want to answer. So. Maybe people are not willing to disclose their earnings or their income, for example. So these are just sort of the, some of the reasons for missing this. And as we go along, we'll talk more about the implications of these different reasons. Um, statisticians have formalized these reasons into a, a three different what are called mechanisms. And again, the idea here is to understand what led to the missing values, because that sort of can help you understand how much of a problem the missing data is and whether sort of the methods we're going to talk about today are even sort of enough to solve the problem. So the first type of missing data is what's called missing completely at random. And I apologize for these terms that are not particularly intuitive. But missing completely at random um, basically means that the missingness is completely at random. Um, it does not depend on anything. So this would be a case, for example, we had a pile of survey forms and the wind came along and just blew 10 of them away and it was just random as to which of those 10 happened to be on top. Um, other examples might be, you know, it's actually, honestly, it's sometimes hard to think of examples of this, but oh, more beeping. <laughs> um, another example might be data entry problems where just sort of the whoever is entering the data just occasionally screws up and, and it's just totally random as to when they screw up. What this means, if, if, if the missingness is completely at random, what it means is that the cases with missing values are just a random subset of the full original sample. Um, another way to say that is that there's no systematic differences between those with missing and observed values. Because of that, if you just do an analysis using the, the people for whom you have complete data, you actually will not, um, you will not have bias in those effect estimates. Uh, the trade-off is you might have low power because you'll be losing sample size. You'll just drop anyone with missing values, um, and so your sample size will be smaller. But it will be a random sample of your original full sample, and so you won't have bias. The catch, again, as I mentioned, is that this is generally an unrealistic scenario, except for cases where you really just have sort of random data entry errors or something like that. Any questions before I move on? Okay. So what's probably a more plausible missing data mechanism is what's called missing at random. And this is one where the missingness depends on things that we observe. So, for example, you might observe gender for everyone, um, and you might see that women are more likely to answer some question than men are. So, because the missingness depends on observed things, it, it might mean that there are differences between the people with observed and missing values, but we observe the ways in which they differ, and we therefore can adjust for that. And this is the mechanism where we could use weighting or imputation approaches 
to, to deal with those differences. And this is what we'll be talking much more about today. So this is probably the assumption made most frequently. Um, and arguably, we'll talk again, we'll talk more about this, but you can actually make it more plausible by including a lot of variables um, in your models and your imputation procedure. The third type of missingness um, is kind of the most problematic, um, but it's important to understand and sort of to think through in, in you know, your own data situation. So the third one is called not missing at random. Sometimes it's called missing not at random, M-N-A-R, but they mean the same thing. And this is one where the probability of a case being missing depends on unobserved things. So for example, the probability of someone reporting their income depends on what their income is. Or, um, for example, there might be a survey question that asks whether uh, people had received psychiatric treatment. You know, people who have not received psychiatric treatment might be very happy to just say no. People who have received psychiatric treatment might be, you know, embarrassed. There might be stigma, and so they might not, they might not want to say yes but they also might not want to lie and say no. So they might just leave that question blank. And so in that way, the missingness, the probability of that question being blank might depend on the actual answer to the question that we don't actually know. So the idea there is that among the people with missing values, it could be that the rate of actual psychiatric treatment is higher than it is among the people with observed values. So the implication of that is, is what I've sort of just said, that we can't use just the observed data to impute the missing values. We have to sort of make some assumption about how they're different. Um, you know, we have to sort of think through, well, so I'll actually I'll talk about it in, um, let me go back, in a particular um, example. There's a nice paper by Sadiq and Bellin that I'll, it's, it's in the reference list where they were looking at a perinatal depression prevention study. And they had attrition over time. I think there were three or four follow-up time points. And they had attrition over time. And they were worried that they brought in sort of the substantive knowledge that they were worried that the people who dropped out might be different from the people who stayed in in unobserved ways. Um, and so what they did was they did an imputation procedure, but they kind of supplemented it with theories about how the people who were missing might differ from those who didn't. So for example, they ran some analyses where they assumed that the missing cases were actually more depressed than the observed cases. Um, but then they also ran some analyses where they assumed that the missing cases were less depressed um, under an assumption that, well, maybe they were less depressed, so they were out and about, and it was harder to contact them for follow-up because they were out working or out, you know, with their children and, and doing things. They weren't sort of sitting at home. But in any case, the, the point I really want to make is that if you, if you really think your data might be not missing at random, that actually takes much, much more complicated methods to handle than, we, than we're going to be able to cover today. Um, and again, it's the sort of thing you have to think through in any given analysis and just really consider whether, you know, your observed characteristics capture what you think the differences are between the people with missing and non-missing values, um, or whether there really might be some other systematic differences. It's always hard to give a webinar and not be able to see people nodding or anything. So hopefully um, this is making some sense. Any any questions before I go on? Okay. Uh, Liz, I just wanted to ask, so this not missing at random, um, it means with missing at random, you can still have a uh, missing value that's conditional on, on the outcome or unobserved value, um, but that's predictable through other observable factors. Right. So this is stuff that's not predictable based on all of your other. Exactly. So even after controlling for differences in age or baseline space or, or anything, yep. um, there's still unobserved differences in like income or whatever. Exactly. And you know, honestly, the way people usually handle this is to actually do something like multi-imputation 
and say, well, let's control for the observed things as, as best as we can. Um, and then maybe we'll assess, you know, whether there's some unobserved thing that's also a problem. But um, in general, you know, honestly, sort of when it comes down to it, generally people assume missing at random, except in some extreme cases where, again, like this depression example, where you really, they really thought that the, the, the people who didn't respond at the follow-ups might really be very systematically different. And again, in ways that were not captured by their observed data. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I've mentioned that most of the time, and we're gonna sort of proceed today assuming missing at random, um, I, I wanna point out that these are assumptions. So we never actually know which missing data mechanism is correct. Um, there are formal tests that you can do to see whether missingness is missing completely at random. Um, I mean, essentially what you do is you see, well, do the um, people with missing versus observed values differ on any other characteristics? If they do, then it's not missing completely at random. Um, and this slide gives like a few sort of details on that. Um, Again, I mean, honestly, most of the time you don't have missing completely at random, and so these tests, you know, 99% of the time will say, no, it's not missing completely at random, um, and so then you move forward and you do a weighting or imputation, which we're gonna talk about. Um, so I, I find these tests not super helpful just because their data is almost never missing completely at random. Um, and again, the other catch, and I think I've actually talked through this already, um, so we often can rule out missing completely at random, but then we actually never know for sure if it's missing at random or not missing at random. And again, you have to use some substantive understanding of what led to the missing data um, in order to, under, to think through whether missing at random is possible. Um, and I think I covered most of this. This Sadiq and Bellin example is there, and then there's some other references um, at the bottom for this. So if you're interested in, in thinking through not missing at random sorts of possibilities, these might be some good references. But again, we're gonna, today, we're gonna proceed uh, assuming that we're willing to assume missing at random. So we're willing to assume that our observed characteristics capture the differences between the people with missing and observed data. So let's, um, I wanna spend some time, I, I know of course we wanna spend most of our time on how, how to handle missing data, but I wanna spend some time first on saying how not to handle missing data, partly because you know, I know some of these approaches are common and I want you to all just have an understanding of what the problems with some of these easy um, approaches are, because honestly they are tempting. They're very easy to implement, um, and so I want to sort of talk through why they aren't um, necessarily the best strategies. So these are the approaches that I'll um, talk through, at least briefly, uh, ignoring it, complete case, single imputation, missing indicators, and uh, something called last observation carried forward. So the first I call ignoring it, um, which basically means you just use whatever statistical software you're using and run whatever descriptives and regression models or whatever you run and you just sort of ignore the fact that there is missing data. Um, the, the problem with this is that what, there's two problems. <laughs> One is that uh, this actually, what the software does about missing data will actually depend on the software. So you may actually, if you ran something in Stata or in SAS or in SPSS, it's possible you'd get different results because of what the software is doing. The other problem is that usually this will be the same as a complete case analysis, which is what I'll talk about next. Um, you know, this was, I found this interesting in part because it, so in part I include this slide now because I had a conversation with a researcher at Hopkins and we were talking about missing data and she said, oh, well, you know, I run whatever, proc logit in SAS and, you know, it doesn't really give me errors and it runs and so I assume that it's doing something correct with the missing data. She sort of assumed that 
SAS was doing something smart with the missing data, not just dropping the missing cases, which is what it actually is doing. Um, and so I, I want to be explicit about this, um, that, you know, 95% of software packages are not going to be doing something smart by default with respect to missing data. Most of the time, they're just going to be dropping any cases that have any missing values. So because of that, let's move on to complete case analysis. So complete case, um, which is also called list-wise deletion, um, basically just restricts the analysis to individuals with observed data. Uh, and we'll see an example of this later. Um, but, you know, we might have a sample that starts of size 1,500. Maybe we have 10 variables in our model, and by the time we have a final sample that has observed data on all 10 variables, we might be down to 1,000 subjects. That's actually what happened in the, in the models that I'll show later. Um, there, and so there's three main problems, well, sort of two main problems with this. Um, the first is that it essentially assumes that the missingness is missing completely at random. Um, in other words, the estimates will be biased unless, in fact, the missingness is missing completely at random. The other problem is that even if that bias isn't huge or missing completely at random is actually reasonable, it leads to de decreased power um, because, it, because you have to drop a lot of these cases. So instead of having 1,500 people in our sample, we run our models with 1,000 people and have reduced power for detecting anything. Um, Jennifer Hill, who's at NYU and does a lot of really interesting work in this area, uh, I had an interesting conversation with her, and, and she pointed out that she also doesn't, I mean, a, a clear other problem with it is that you lose representativeness. You, you know, if we drop down to 1,000 people, our estimates are then only sort of appropriate for those 1,000 people, not for our original sample. Um, and again, I'll talk more about this later, but it basically means that you can no longer be making statements about your original sample, only about the sample that you've retained in the analysis. Um, this can be particularly problematic in longitudinal settings where you might have a lot of attrition and you don't want to necessarily only be making statements about the people who stay in the study the whole time. You really want to be making statements about the original full study sample. Um, related to that is that <laughs> this, the sample that you end up having is also model dependent. So we might run one model and have a 1,000 people, but then maybe we want to add a variable to our model that had a lot of missingness, and so our sample might drop down to, I don't know, 600. And so the sample that we're running our models on will vary model to model, um, which is just messy <laughs> and hard. It's hard to interpret the results. It's hard to sort of interpret changes in the models. Um, it just is not, uh, it's not a good way to be doing analyses. Okay, so then um, a slightly smarter way of handling missing data is um, what's called single imputation, um, where basically you fill in or impute each missing value. Um, you know, so we can think of our data set as having a bunch of question marks in it, and a single imputation will just go in and, and replace each of those question marks with a, a number. There's a few ways of doing that, um, and I'm going to talk through these in part because they're they'll be relevant for our multiple imputation discussion as well. Let's get some water. Okay, so the simplest way of doing that imputation, of filling in those question marks, is, just, is what's just called a mean imputation. So, for example, if someone is missing age, you just put in the mean age. Um, a slightly smarter for, uh, way of doing it is what's called regression prediction where basically it's almost like a mean imputation, but within categories defined by other variables. So for example, we fit a regression among the observed cases, so we might regress age as a function of um, location, you know, state and gender and race or something. Um, and so we might be able to pre impute the mean age given a couple characteristics, observed characteristics. 
the drawback of that one is it doesn't account for any uncertainty in that regression model. That just will predict the mean, you know, for every individual with the same, say, gender and race, it will predict the same average age. The, the third approach on this slide is, is regression prediction plus error. Um, and basically, it's the same as that previous, except it adds some random noise. So it accounts for the fact that maybe some, um, that maybe we don't predict age very well, and so we have a lot of error. And so then when we impute the age for a given, um, you know, fifth, uh, sorry, black male, sometimes we'll impute 52, and sometimes we'll impute 47, and sometimes, you know, 58. There'll be some variability in those imputations across people. Does that make sense? Okay, there's um, two other approaches I want to mention, um, in part because you might see discussion of them um, in, for example, software, and so I want to describe what they do. Um, one is called Hot Deck. Um, it's actually a, a pretty cool approach where the idea is for each person with missing data, for example, again, let's, let's hypothesize someone with missing age, we find all the individuals with the same values of other variables that we observe. So we find all the people with the, for a given person with missing age, we find all the people who have the same race and the same gender and live in the same city. Okay. And then we basically draw randomly from them to predict our missing person's age. The benefit of this of this hot deck is that your imputations, the values you impute, are always within the range of the observed data. Uh, so for example, if you're imputing a test score and that test runs from zero to 100, some of these procedures, like the regression we just talked about, might actually yield imputations that are above 100 or below zero. This hot deck won't, in fact, it will only impute values that were actually observed in the data set. Sort of related to that, kind of a, a mix of the regression prediction and the hot deck is, is something called predictive mean matching. Um, and this is a little hard to explain, but I'll, hopefully it will be sort of clear. Uh, the idea here is you sort of, you do the regression prediction, like at the, at the bottom, of this slide, but then instead of, um, of imputing from this y hat, you impute from the observed value for someone who had a similar predicted value. So you find someone who had a similar predicted age from this model, but whose age was actually observed, and we impute that observed age instead of the predicted age. Um, I mention this in part because this approach, um, again, You'll see it in software, and it's particularly helpful when the, the variables with missing data are non-normally distributed or have sort of strange distributions or, for example, bounds. Um, and again, we'll, we'll come back to this more when we talk more about multiple imputation. Um, but I want to at least sort of describe the, the big picture of sort of how it works. Any, well, let me, I'll, I'll do a couple more slides and then pause for a minute to take any questions. Two other um, strategies that are quite common, um, but generally incorrect, <laughs> are um, what's called, or what I call a missing data indicator approach. Um, so this is one where you, you know, you say, well, okay, we have missing age, so I'm just going to impute the mean age for everyone with missing age. But then in my regression models or, you know, the, my models that I'm running for my actual analyses, I'll include age and I will include um, a variable that indicates whether age was missing or not, an indicator variable for missingness. And so I think it's, it's intuitive. People sort of like it because it's very simple to implement, but it feels better than, single, than a straight single imputation because you think, well, my analysis is at least accounting for the fact that some people had missing values and some did not. The problem is that it's sort of a false sense of security in that um, there's lots of work, these are some citations, um, showing that this can really lead to bias in 
uh, for example, coefficient estimates in a regression model. So if you do this regression where you regress, say, income on age and the missing data indicator for missing age, the coefficient on age will be biased because of this missing, because of using this strategy. Um, so I basically do not recommend it, um, even though, again, it sort of feels good because it feels like, well, it's easy to implement and it feels like you're accounting for the missingness. The problem is that you're not really accounting for it in a correct way. Finally, and this one might be less um, relevant for these sorts of the sorts of studies you all do. It's it's very relevant for um, FDA trials, for example. And so this is relevant for longitudinal studies where you have um, quite a few repeated measures on each person. So um, maybe we have blood measures obtained every six months. What this approach does is basically if someone drops out of the study, their last value that was observed is just imputed for every follow-up time point that they then weren't there for. Um, there's some belief in the clinical trials world that this is sort of a, quote, conservative way of handling missing data. Um, but it's not actually, and it, it leads to bias. I mean, you can imagine, you know, the, probably people drop out because something changed in their life. You know, maybe some of them died, for example. And simply assuming that their blood measures stayed the same for the rest of the time period is, is quite unrealistic. So I mention it. Um, again, in part, I'm mentioning some of these because, you know, six months from now, you may come across a paper that does one of these, and you might think, oh, this seems like a reasonable approach. <laughs> so I wanted to sort of talk through why they are not so reasonable. Um, so before uh, we, I take a, I step, I pause for a sec for questions, I wanted to just conclude with a discussion of why the single imputation approaches um, are not appropriate. So if you're going to do single imputation, um, then the best approaches are um, what I called the regression prediction plus error or a hot deck approach. And in fact, these can be quite reasonable ways of handling missing data, especially if you don't have a lot. So for example, if someone comes to me and they have a data set that is in really good shape and each variable only has maybe one or two or three percent missing values, I say, you know, why don't you just go ahead and do a single imputation? Um, you know, for that small proportion of missingness, it's very unlikely uh, that this would, that would cause trouble, and, and I'll say more about why. The, the, the reason it causes trouble more generally is the problem with single imputation is that it leads to overly precise estimates. So the issue is that you, so you fill in the question marks in that data set. You fill in the holes. You, you impute values for any variable that had missing. You then run whatever analyses you were going to run. And the problem is that those analyses don't know that some of the values that it's using were actually imputed. It doesn't know that some of those values were actually guesses. So it treats all of the data as if it was fully observed, sort of known actual values, um, and doesn't take into account any uncertainty that is produced because you have missing data. Um, so because of this, it's what's called anti-conservative in that the standard errors will be too small, your p-values will be too small, which, you know, I understand, <laughs> you know, sometimes people want that. But it really will lead to, can lead to very incorrect inferences uh, because you'll be sort of thinking that you have more data than you really do. Uh, but again, when you really only have like say one or two percent missing, that uncertainty due to the missing values is, is probably not very big. You know, that's not really going to change the standard errors very much. And so that's why it's not a, hor a single imputation is not a horrible thing to do if you don't have much missingness. Okay, so before we move on to sort of the good things to do to handle missing data, um, I want to take a second and see if there are any questions. Okay, um, so we will dive into 
appropriate ways of handling missing data. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about maximum likelihood and this alternative sources of information. Um, but then, again, we'll focus on weighting and, and really focus on multiple imputation. One thing I want to highlight is that, um, and this is sort of a, a big picture comment, but I'll say it now. So sometimes reviewers on papers, for example, um, you know, if I submit a paper with people and we've done multiple imputation, occasionally a reviewer will say, well, you're just making up data, that multiple imputation is, you know, wrong. You're not, you know, you're just making up data and I don't trust it, essentially. I, I think there's two main things to keep in mind. Um, the first is that, as we'll learn, the benefit of multiple imputation is that it accounts for the fact that you are kind of making up data, um, as opposed to single imputation, which, as we just discussed, does not. But the other important thing to remember is that we aren't trying, and I hope this is sort of a subtle point, but hopefully it will make sense. We're going to impute each individual's values, but we don't really care about those individual values themselves. In the sense that, you know, let's say Joe has missing age, we're not really trying to make statements about Joe's age, and we're not really trying to guess what Joe's age is. We're trying to get accurate parameter estimates about, you know, the relationship between um, income and age or, you know, whatever. Whatever our sort of research question of interest is, which is it's not a question about Joe. It's a question about the sample and the data and sort of our, our research study. Um, and so we impute Joe's age in order to get to that, but, you know, we aren't really thinking about it in the sense of trying to really get a guess as to what Joe's age is. Again, we, we do that on, along the way, but that's not sort of the goal. So hopefully that sort of makes sense, but I think that's, that's sometimes why people react and say, well, I don't want to do imputation because I don't want to be making up data. Um, but in fact, the imputation is what allows us to make accurate inferences. Okay. I'm not going to talk about this much, um, but I do at least want to mention maximum likelihood approaches. So in some cases, um, an easy, well, not an easy, <laughs> in some cases, a way to handle missing data are what are known as maximum likelihood approaches. Um, you might hear of these called things like full information maximum likelihood, F-I-M-L. And basically what they do is they work for situations when Formally, you can factor the likelihood and have different likelihoods for people with missing versus observed data. Um, the most common situation for this is ones where you have longitudinal data, um, you know, repeated measures of, yeah, say, repeated depression measures over time, and, and those outcomes are the only thing you have missing. And you have some people who sort of come in and out of the sample, you know, here and there, um, but you have fully observed covariates, and again, the only thing you're missing is that some people don't have all of their outcome measures um, available. In that scenario, there are these maximum likelihood methods that you can use, and software such as MPLUS or LISREL um, will run them. Um, and again, it's called things like full information maximum likelihood. Um, the reason I'm not going to focus on them today is partly because I and more of a multi-imputation sort of person, um, but they're also just less less general in some sense. They work for some particular data settings, um, but they're much less general. Um, and so I think it's, if you're going to learn one tool, uh, learning a multi-imputation sort of tool um, will serve you better in general. Um, there's this other drawback that won't make a lot of sense right now, so I think I'll come back to that later. If you do want to learn about maximum likelihood methods, um, this Graham 2008 paper is a very nice discussion of them, um, and then also the Sadiq paper. And again, we'll, we'll cover them very briefly at the end, but these are, um, should all be in the reference list at the end. So I just wanted to highlight that, of course, sometimes you also have cases where you actually can get the missing data from other sources. Um, I work occasionally in sort of criminology and there, um, for example, there's, there's different national data sets that can be used to, to get, for example, county crime rates. Um, and so I'm just sort of encouraging, you know, sometimes if you think 
broadly, you can actually bring in other data sources to help um, fill in the missing values. Okay, so now let's dive into the details of um, non-response weighting. Um, so this is going to be appropriate for cases where we're dealing with attrition. So we just we have a follow-up survey, and 80% we only get 80% of our original samples. 20% of the people we just can't find. You know, they or we find them, but they refuse to respond. Um, non, what non-response weighting does is it. Uh, basically weights respondents by their inverse probability of response. So um, you, you, you fit a model predicting, actually this should say predicting response given the observed covariance. So for each person, you label them a responder or a non-responder, i.e. someone you have data on versus not, and you fit a logistic regression as a function with, you know, predicted by um, very background characteristics on them that you might have collected at an initial survey or maybe from sampling frame or something. You then weight the respondents by one over their probability of being a respondent. What this does is it weights the respondents to look like everyone. So for example, if someone had a um, low probability of responding, say 0.2, but they actually did respond, their weight is going to be 1 over 0.2, which is, <laughs> I should have, I'm not, you know, it's going to be 5. So that person, essentially what that's saying is that that person looks like a non-respondent, but they actually responded, and so they actually give us a lot of information about the non-respondents. And so we upweight them in the analysis. Um, if any of you are familiar with sort of survey sampling ideas and, you know, the fact that you might have um, a survey sample where people have different probabilities of being selected for the survey and you then weight them by one over their probability of selection, this is the exact same sort of thinking and the math behind it is exactly the same. Um, the, the difference is that instead of knowing that probability because you, from the survey design, you estimate it by fitting this model of response. Um, again, it, it works very well for simple missing data patterns. So if you just have this sort of simple dropout kind of response, non-response scenario. So, um, oh, good. Okay, so here's a, just a slight example of this. This is just at a simple level. Imagine that we have 200 people total in our original sample, um, 100 males and 100 females. But then 80 males and 75 females respond. So what this will do is we'll basically weight, we can weight separately for males and females. So the male respondents will each get a weight of 1.25, um, reflecting the fact that each respondent has to sort of count for 1.25 of the total sample. Female respondents will get a slightly higher weight, 1.33, because fewer females responded. So we need to weight the females up more in order to get back to the original sample. Um, and so what this will do is we could run analyses using the 80 males and the 75 females, but when weighted, we could make statements about, like the results will, will, ref, will be results for the full sample of 200 people. Um, so I think I mentioned this already, um, but again, to implement it, you fit this, um, this like a logistic regression, for example, predicting response uh, as a function of things that you observe. Um, and then again, the respondents get a weight of one over their probability of response. You then use those weights in the same way that you use survey sampling weights. Um, you know, for example, the state is SVY commands or Sudan in SAS. Um, and again, the conclusions will hold for the original sample. Um, these, this sort of idea can be used both for attrition, where you have a, a longitudinal stu study and you uh, lose people over time, and it also is often used for sort of original survey response, where you might have a survey just at one point in time, um, but you don't get, again, like my little male-female example, we don't get the full sample that we really wanted to get. Um, in terms of uh, slide 28 has a few um, sort of 
vague guidance. I mean, one thing I will note is the last bullet. You know, this is actually a pretty simple and quite widely accepted way of handling attrition um, or unit non-response. Before going to Hopkins, I worked at Mathematica Policy Research, which does a lot of sort of large-scale evaluations and such. And this was sort of the default way of handling non-response and, and attrition. Um, and I think it's widely accepted in the field as sort of a very appropriate way to do that. Um, I guess I said some of this, there are two concerns, actually. The first bullet alludes to the first, which is that um, remembering back to our missing data mechanisms, this is going to assume missing at random. So it's missing at random given the variables that you have in this model of, weight, of the weighting model. So you basically want that model to capture what you think are the differences between the people who respond and don't respond. Because you're trying to argue that once you account for these observed characteristics, the respondents can represent the non-respondents. That, you know, once we account for their age and their education level and their, you know, income and some information we might know about them, we can sort of use the respondents to represent the, the full original sample. The other concern is about these extreme weights. Um, you'll notice, so the weight is one over this probability of response. What can happen sometimes is um, if you have someone who has a very low probability of response but did respond, you can have some large weights. So you might have an individual who gets a weight of 1,000 or 1,500 or, or something. Um, and, and that can lead to um, variance, like instability in the variant, like variances that are too big and, and just sort of instability in the models. Um, to avoid that, what's recommended is to check the distribution of the weights, and, and often what people do is just trim the outliers. So unfortunately, there's not actually great guidance on this in terms of how to do that trimming, but you know, maybe trim the weights to the 95th percentile, say. Or I've honestly just seen trim anything above 10, you set back to 10. Don't ask me where the number 10 comes from. Um, but sort of things like that where you just are trying to limit the influence of some of these people who might have really extreme weight. Um, the other strategy sometimes people do is instead of actually giving the weight of one over the probability, you just form five groups and, and do weights within those five groups. So it's sort of a smoother version of, of the probabilities. Um, if you're interested in these more, again, um, some of these references down here at the bottom um, get, go into more of the details. Liz, is there um, a threshold for a response rate, like beyond which you kind of throw in the towel? And um, I don't like to give a threshold. Um, for two reasons, and this actually relates to a question at the very end, because um, it also relates to missing data in general, like what percentage of you know, missing values should you just throw in the towel? Um, uh, and, and so the two reasons, the first um, is sort of relates to the missing at random assumption, in that you know, maybe we lose, maybe we only have 20% of our sample, but if they really are just a random, like say they just magically were a completely random sample of our full, we could weight them up to the original sample and, and be in very good shape. Um, so another way to say that is that, or another, well, actually I'll come back to it more in a minute later when we talk about multiple imputation. Um, the other reason I don't like to give thresholds is that I think that different questions might have different thresholds in the sense that for some surveys, we might have absolutely no information on a given topic, and if all we can do is get a 30% response rate, you know, we try our best, and that might be all we can do. I'm, I'm working with a student at Hopkins who's um, studying, um, shoot, what are they called, peer-run peer organizations for, for people with mental illness, and she has a list of every single peer-run organization in the country, um, and she's doing a survey, and She's actually getting reasonable response. I think she's getting maybe 60%. She was concerned about maybe getting 20 or 30. Um, 
but the thinking was like we have no data on these organizations right now and you know getting some data on them is probably at least better than none any conclusions of course would be very cautious and would sort of appropriately say that this is a limitation but you know i just i don't like to give cutoffs because it really just depends on again what's known in that field whether there's other data that might you know be able to be used that sort of thing um, i mean that said i do know like omb has rules where i think it's 80 percent i think like if there's a, a federally sponsored survey you guys probably actually know better than i do um, they sort of won't accept it if it has less than i think 80 percent same with like the what works clearinghouse they have some threshold like that um, but again it i think those thresholds sometimes come in sort of assuming you're not going to be do any, doing any kind of adjustment, um, when in fact, if you do like a weighting adjustment, 80 or 50% response might be fine if you really do capture the differences between the people who respond and those who don't. You know, really the concern is, do you think there's not missing at randomness going on? And that's when you'd really have to be concerned more so than just what's the percent of missing data. I know that's a hedgy answer, but does that help? Yes, it, it does. Um, I, I think you make a good point that if you don't have any other data, you just kind of use what you have and report the limitations and do what you can in terms of accounting for the non-response bias that you know exactly. some observables. Exactly. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the guts, which is item non-response. So we're now going to turn to multiple imputation, which um, again is going to be more appropriate for settings where um, you just have these sort of sporadic missing values. Someone responded to a survey, but they didn't answer all the questions. So the short story of multiple imputation is that it's the exact same thing I described as single imputation, but you just do that multiple times, hence the name. So, shoot, I'm now that I'm doing this, I'm re realizing I had some other slides that I sort of forgot to put in here. But anyway, um, you so the idea is you basically do a single imputation, like you do that regression. Let me actually go back. Uh, you say you do this model at the bottom, where you do a single, you do an imputation, and you add on some noise, but then you do that multiple times. So for you know Joe who's missing his age, we impute his age once, and we might impute 54. And then we impute his age again, and we might impute 58. And then we impute his age again, and we might impute 42. Um, and you do this multiple times. I'm going to use 10 often in the discussion. And you create these sort of 10 complete data sets. So uh, we would impute all the missing values once. We then impute all the missing values again. Etc. And in the end, we have these, say, 10 complete data sets. What's nice is then there's sort of these results that were basically what you do is you then, and we're going to go through this in more detail, but you take each data set and you run whatever analysis you want to run on it. Um, you run a regression, you run a big fancy Bayesian model, you run propensity score methods, you run whatever, and you have no missing values in that data set. And so anything runs very easily and it's, it's all clean. What you then do is you've run this in those 10 different data sets. There are then these what are called the combining rules where you combine the estimates across those 10. So again, we'll see examples, but for example, you get a, a regression coefficient. You get 10 regression coefficients, one from each complete data set, and then you use these combining rules to combine them into one final effect estimate or coefficient estimate. Um, don't worry, though, actually, the software will do all of that for you. Um, I'll show you some state of code later where you'll see that running a regression in multiply imputed data is a, all you do is add two words to a standard regression command. And it sort of looks almost the same as if you had just had a data set with no missing values. Um, so I, I'll talk about these combining rules, but you don't actually really need to worry about them very much because the software will do it for you. What makes multiple imputation work 
um, is that if you remember, my complaint about single imputation was that the variances are too small. Um, but for in these combining rules for multiple imputation, the variance will be a the total variance will be a combination of what's called the within imputation variance, but then also the between imputation variance. So in other words, it will take into account the uncertainty in the imputation. And so the variance will get bigger, and it gets bigger just the right amount to account for the fact that some of these values were imputed, not known observed values. Um, the last bullet on this slide is sort of an aside, which is just that one other nice thing about multiple imputation is that it's very general. You can actually set up, for example, if you're working with a research team, you can set up a multi multiply imputed data, sort of one person can do that, and then they could distribute that data to various people within the team, all of whom might, might run slightly different models, but you would know that they're running them on the same multiply imputed data and sort of using the same method to handle the missingness. Okay, so the sort of traditional approach to creating multiple imputations was uh, what's called a joint model of all the variables. So for example, you might just assume a multivariate normal distribution, that basically any, var any variable in the data set is normally distributed and they have this multivariate normal joint distribution. Um, and so then that would be used to impute the missing values. Um, I'm going to sort of skip this quickly, basically because it's not, uh, the problem with this approach is that of course often our variables are not normally distributed. We often have categorical variables, um, binary variables, counts, etc. This approach also doesn't work very well if you have a lot of variables, you know, if you try to, if you have 100 variables in your data you're trying to impute, trying to fit a 100-dimensional multivariate normal is just not feasible. So it's, it's nice and clean in sort of small data scenarios, but it doesn't, it's not very scalable, it's not really very practical for real-world data sets. Um, as an aside, if you, for example, SAS PROC MI, their default is to use this multivariate normal assumption. Um, Stata's MI package um, now, I'll talk more about that in a second, but um, originally also would sort of only do this. So the approach that I prefer to create for creating multiple imputations, you guys still there on my screen? Yeah, my screen just went blank too. <laughs> Let me... Uh, Let me just make sure. I will reshare my screen. It's back. Okay. Okay, good. I don't know what happened there. Weird. Um, okay. So the um, the imputa imputation approach that I, I prefer is what's called, well, it has a few names. Um, it's called, I tend to call it MICE because it's easier, multiple imputation by chained equations. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see it's also sometimes called fully conditional specification or sequential regression multiple imputation. Um, what this approach does is it basically just takes, it's sort of intuitive in a way, it just takes um, each variable one at a time and it fits a model for each variable given all the others in the data and imputes the variables sort of one at a time. What's nice about that is that you can tailor the imputation of a, of a given variable to that variable. So if it's a categorical variable, you can use the logistic model. If it's binary, if it's, sorry, categorical, you could use like a multinomial logit. If it's continuous, you can use a linear model. If it's binary, you could use logistic. Um, and I'll now step through this sort of very simple little example where we, let's consider we just have three variables in our data. Um, x1, which is binary, x2, which is continuous, and x3, which is ordinal. So what MICE will do is first it sort of does essential, essentially placeholder imputations. It just imputes all the missing values, say, using the mean. It's not really important what it uses in this first step. It just fills in the missing values with anything. Then it will take x1 and it will fit 
uh, among people who had observed X1, it will fit a logistic regression of X1 given the other two variables. And it will use that logistic regression to then predict the missing values of X1. And because, remember that because in step one we sort of put in these placeholder values, that step two can be done using everyone in the data with observed X1. Temporarily, no one has missing X2 or X3 at this point. We then move to step three, and among cases with the observed X2, we fit a linear normal regression model of X2 given X1 and X3, and we predict the missing values of X2. Move on to X3, fit proportional odds, predict the missing values of X3. The catch is we then have to iterate. Um, because that first imputation, step one, was sort of a placeholder, when we did, say, step two, we were using kind of placeholder values for X2 and X3. So now we sort of iterate, and we do this again, where we've gotten better imputations for X2 and X3, so we do step two again. And then we've gotten better imputations for X1, so we do step three again. And you iterate steps two, three, and four until it's some measure of convergence. In other words, that your, that your imputations are stable, that these models are not changing anymore. And again, the reason for that is, is purely because at that first stage, we sort of did this placeholder imputation to fill in all the missing values temporarily. You then, so we iterate until this convergence, we, that will give us one imputed data set. We then repeat this whole process multiple times in order to get multiple imputations. Make sense? Okay. So what are the pros and cons? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the benefit of this MICE approach is that it works very easily in large data sets. Um, I've, we've used it with hundreds of variables at the same time. Um, the other nice thing is, as I mentioned, it can it accurately reflects the distribution of each variable, you know, binary, continuous, count, whatever. It also allows bounds quite easily. For example, we can make sure that um, the age that someone started smoking is restricted to be greater than, I don't know, five or whatever some minimum age that we want to put in would be. Um, and you could also incorporate restrictions quite easily. Um, for example, if you might want to only impute the age someone started smoking among the people who said that they are smokers. Those things are all quite easy to do in the MICE framework um, as in comparison to this sort of joint model. The, the drawback of this approach which is sort of a technical one, um, but it, it basically is that the problem with fitting all these individual models one at a time, like steps two, three, and four, is that it does not necessarily mean that these models sort of fit together. There is not necessarily a coherent joint distribution for X1, X2, and X3. In some weird cases, you then could sort of have weird situations where your imputation of one variable is somewhat, is sort of inconsistent with your imputation of another. Um, I raise this because this is, you know, sort of when people talk about mice, this is the limitation that's always raised. That said, um, you know, it seems to actually not be a very big problem in practice. It's sort of, it seems to be kind of one of these limitations that is a limitation in theory and theoretical statisticians sort of think about it and complain about it. But in terms of actually creating imputations that perform well and make sense, um, it doesn't seem to really be a problem. Okay, so um, just briefly, um, there's various software packages to implement MICE. Um, for SAS, there's a package called IVEWare, which is um, basically an add-on package. Um, for Stata, there's a package called ICE, um, which is now, for those of you who, who have, um, I guess it's, I think Stata 11 or 12, they now have this new MI package or sort of suite for missing data, and ICE is now incorporated into that, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, if any of you use R, um, there's some really nice packages for R called MICE or MI, and I'll be talking more about um, these later. Um, 
right now I'll just quickly mention too, um, Ashley had sent out a, a PDF along with the slides that basically has sample code for R, Stata, and SAS. Um, you know, it, it's not perfectly documented and stuff, but it would at least give you a place to start. Um, and I'll try to talk about that briefly more uh, towards the end. So let's sort of think through the steps to implementing these approaches. Um, there's sort of four steps that I'll cover. Uh, the first is, oh, sorry, okay, before we move into the steps, um, I'm going to use as a motivating example um, the New York City PRAMS data. Um, Ashley was nice enough to assemble sort of a, a toy data set um, that we could use as illustration. Um, oh, and sorry, the <laughs> actually I forgot to fix this. Um, we're going to be um, predicting small for gestational age um, as a function of other predictors. So let's imagine that we are researchers and we want to look at the predictors of small for gestational age. Um, and we have various demographics, health measures, et cetera. In this data set that we're using for illustration, um, there are about 40 possible predictors, um, but there's lots of missingness. So we'll, we'll talk through how to, how to handle that. Um, I'll also just mention right now while I'm thinking of it, these two papers referenced at the bottom also um, have a, another fairly in-depth example. The Azer et al. paper in particular is um, meant to be sort of a tutorial for stepping through using these approaches. Okay, so in the PRAMS data, um, this table just shows the rates of missingness. I just sort of picked these somewhat randomly to show. It sort of showed the variability. Some, like BMI, are missing almost never. Um, the variable with the most missingness was income um, at 21%. And the others are sort of in between. Okay, um, I'm, I don't show you the details of this, but um, just trust me that the, the, the missingness is not missing completely at random. The, if you look at, say, the people with missing income versus not missing income, they differ on some of the other characteristics that we observe. Um, but we're going to assume that the missingness is um, missing at random. We're going to assume that we can account for the differences in the people with missing versus observed values. Okay. So, the big step is, of course, to generate the imputations. Um, and we're going to, um, I'll sort of step through this uh, and show you some code in a minute for, for how to do it. I think I, let me just, yes, okay. Um, so the first um, comment, and these are going to be, I'm sorry, this field's not it's quite in the right order, but um, there's a few things to think about. So the first thing to think about is, you know, I mentioned that mice is very nice because mice is nice. Uh, mice is nice because it can handle different distrib different uh, variable distributions. That said, you know, if it's a if it's a continuous variable, it will often be using a linear regression. So it's best if you can transform the data to at least make it sort of more normally distributed. So sometimes you you would want to look and and look at the variables and see if they're skewed or, or whatever and, and try to transform them to make them less skewed and more normally distributed because that will help improve the imputations. Um, the other alternative is that if you really have a variable that is sort of non-normally distributed and there's not much you can do about it, um, that's where, again, this predictive mean matching um, could be useful. As another aside, this, this white 2011 paper is a really, really nice paper that is very practical and talks through um, sort of the complexities that you might encounter in doing um, some of these, in, in doing multiple imputations. Um, the other, um, so a few other notes. So, uh, let me take a step back for a second. So the, rem remember that the general strategy of mice is we're going to say, we have these 40 variables that we want to use in our analyses, and we want to create multiple imputations. So we want to create, say, 10 imputed data sets where all 40 variables have had all their missing values filled in. And we're going to do that using this MICE procedure that will sort of impute all 40 variables in the same procedure. So, uh, so now this relates to the next couple comments. The first is that you may say to yourself, well, but really my analysis model – 
is only going to have 10 predictors in it. I have these other 30 variables, but I really only think these 10 are really related to small for gestational age, and, and these other 30 I'm not going to be including. It turns out that it actually makes a lot of sense to include those extra variables in your imputation model. And they're what are the, called auxiliary variables. Um, the idea basically is that they might not be of interest to you, but they might be very useful in predicting the missing values. Um, you know, a, a sort of silly example of this might be something where you're examining something that has a parent report of a child's behavior. You might also have teacher report of child, that child's behavior in the data set, and it may be that your analysis, for whatever reason, is only using the parent report. But if you probably using the teacher report will really help you impute the parent report. And so including the teacher report in the imputation procedure will really help improve the imputation. And there's sort of fairly small cost to putting more variables in. The one cost there is, is that is what the bottom part of the slide talks about, which is that if you have a lot, a lot of variables, I've run this with, say, 400 variables, clearly you're not going to run these, these, you know, individual mice models, these sort of steps, with 400 predictors. Um, so in that case, what people often do is a stepwise sort of selection procedure, where you basically tell the, tell the mice package, yeah, don't use all 400 variables. Um, do a stepwise procedure and pick the ones that are most useful for predicting, you know, the given missing variable you're working on. Um, and we'll see an example of that um, later. It's particularly easy to implement that in the IVEware package, but these add-on packages for Stata make it pretty easy too. Okay, so uh, this relates to some of the previous discussion, but. Um, you might be, you know, first question is, well, what variables should I include in my imputation procedure? You know, again, maybe my analysis is only going to have 10 variables, but should I think about including others? So the first thing to say is that you need to include any variable that will be used in the subsequent analysis. Um, the reason for that is if you don't, you're going to bias your findings towards the null. So let's think through an example. Let's imagine we're interested in the relationship between small for gestational age and um, mother's smoking status during pregnancy. If I do my imputation procedure and I don't use smoking status in the imputation, those imputations for the missing small for gestational age variable are going to be done ignoring smoking status. So the imputations will be created in a way that assumes there's no relationship between smoking and small for gestational age. So I'll do these imputations, I'll create my imputations, and then I'll run my analysis and I might find, oh, there's no relation between small for gestational age and smoking, but that might really be just because your imputations were done in such a way that assumed that there was no relationship. Um, that will be particularly problematic if you have high rates of missing data. Related to that, um, if you have any interest in, for example, interactions, like the interaction between race and uh, urban location in predicting small for gestational age, you should include that race by urban location interaction in the imputation for the same reason I just described. Uh, but again, you can be fairly loose. Um, and include quite a few variables. So again, it's, it's almost the strategy of it's better to sort of throw in the kitchen sink um, than to leave out variables that may in the end um, be important. One other quick note at the bottom um, is that you might be sort of wondering, well, you know, in my small for gestational age analysis, like that's sort of our, that's our kind of outcome, our dependent variable of interest. When doing the imputations though, you sort of ignore that. You just treat all the variables the same way. You, you don't account for the fact of like what type of variable they are. Um, and again, that's in part what then makes it possible to use the same imputed data set for different analyses, where you know, in some analyses, maybe small for gestational age will be the dependent variable, and in others, it might be the independent variable. Um, a few other sort of technical 
points. Um, the first bullet is actually what we've already talked about in the sense that um, you need to make your imputation model be sort of more general than the analysis model. So again, like whatever variables are in your analysis model need to be in the imputation model. Um, the other question, though, is how many imputations to generate. Um, this has actually been an interesting, I'm going to skip the details in the middle here. Um, it's interesting because originally when, so Don Rubin is, was my advisor and got schooled by, in the interest of full disclosure, um, and he was the original sort of inventor of multiple imputation. And the, his original work sort of said, oh, five to ten imputations is enough. And I think back then, computations were more difficult, and so people thought, oh, phew, I only have enough memory to do five, so that's great. It turns out um, that actually doing more imputations is better in the sense that you'll get higher power. Um, five to ten will, be, will give you the appropriate bias reduction, but you'll have more power if you do, say, 40 imputations. And now, given you know, computing power and, and computer memory space, it's often just as easy to do 40 as it is to do 10, so you sort of might as well do 40. Um, as sort of an aside, oops, uh, there is a nice data command that you can actually use to see if you've done enough imputations. Um, and it basically checks kind of the variability in the imputations and gives a, a guide for whether doing more imputations would stabilize things. Okay, and I already talked about the auxiliary variables and that um, they might really help, so I think I'll skip this. Okay. One um, sort of aside, and actually, I'm sorry, we had originally thought about doing a depression outcome, but it didn't work out. It's a long story. Um, it didn't work out for sort of silly reasons on my end. Um, but you could imagine a world where this is true in general, that sometimes you might have a variable that's a function of other variables. So, for example, in this case, depression was um, a function of um, three, you know, a sadness measure, a, a sort of loss of hope measure, and a kind of, I forget the exact term, but something like tiredness or not having energy measure. Um, and so you might wonder, well, should I impute kind of the combined version, depre like depress as the combined measure, or should I impute the three individual variables and then create their summary, the, the depressed variable, after? Um, generally, it's best to impute them separately and then recreate the depression summary variable after the imputations are created. Um, this is also relevant for cases where you might have a, a scale with, say, 10 items within a scale. And you really are going to use some summary measure from that scale. Um, and the question is, should you impute the 10 items or just the summary? The, the bene there's two benefits to doing the, imp the individual items separately. One is that with this idea of making the imputation more general than the analysis model, it, it keeps it more general in that you allow for sort of different relationships for the different items. Um, it also allows you the flexibility of potentially using those individual items in subsequent analyses. The other reason is that in some cases, you know, in a scale, for example, you might have someone who responded to eight of the ten items. You wouldn't want to necessarily just treat that person as being missing totally for that scale. You might want to use the fact that you have data on the eight to help impute just those two for that person. So it sort of helps you retain all of the data that you might have on an individual. Okay, so this, this is, I know, kind of out of the blue, but just to show you sort of sample code, and again, there's more details on this and sort of more background in the other PDF um, that Ashley sent out. But for example, in R, using the MI package, there's just this one line. <laughs> um, there's a little bit of setup before you get to this one line. But this line will run mice on a data set um, using particular variables in the models. Um, you know, sort of for 10 iterations, it will create 10 data sets. And this seed, um, for those of you who know about random number generation, this is just a seed, same in state, there's a seed, which ensures that you can recreate and get the exact same results. So that if you run this twice, you'll get the exact same. 10 imputed data sets. So it's, it's nice for replication purposes. 
Um, in Stata, the package I recommend for mice is called ICE. And, um, and here, again, similarly, you basically just send it all your variable names for the variables you want to impute. Um, there are some options at the end, like that you want to save the data. You want 10 imputations. Um, this boot is essentially like the predictive mean matching kind of thing. Um, I'm not, I don't really have time to get into all the details, but you know this is a you know a fairly easy command. And again, there's there's more details, and I'll I'll point you to more references on all the nitty gritty. But either of these commands will run the mice procedure and create 10 imputed data sets. After you've done that, you want to do some checking to make sure that things look okay. Um, and basically, there's sort of, I tend to try to do two types of comparisons. So first is before and after imputation, just to, and I'll talk more on that in a second. The other is that you might want to modify the imputation procedure just a little bit. For example, different stepwise criteria if you're using a stepwise model, um, and just sort of see how different the imputations are. You know, are, are they sensitive to what you think of as sort of things that aren't very big changes? Um, I will note that most packages have pretty limited diagnostics. Um, the packages for R have the most, and I'll show you an example in a second. The other thing I really want to highlight, actually, I'll come back to this in a second when we get, well, yeah, I'll come back to, well, no, I'll say it now. <laughs> partly because of, of how things look with this data. But um, one important thing to remember um, is that, say, a difference before and after imputation doesn't necessarily mean that something is wrong. You know, for example, let's say that our mean income is actually quite different before versus after imputation. That may actually be exactly what the imputation is trying to fix. Um, you know, it may be that people with missing, with you know, missing income ended up sort of, we think, having lower income, and so maybe once we impute, the overall income average goes down. Um, so again, a change is not necessarily bad. I tend to just look at the changes to sort of understand, well, is that a change that I think is reasonable, or do I think there's something weird going on with these imputations and, like, there are some outliers or, or some problem like that. So. Um, I'm going to just show you uh, this quick slide. This is a nice example from the um, MI package in R, um, where for each continuous variable, actually, sorry, for each variable, not just continuous, these show density plots. So the blue line of each is the distribution of that variable um, in the original data, the observed cases. And then each of the red lines is one of the imputed data sets. Um, so, for example, here in income, you can see that actually it does look like maybe the imputed incomes tended to be lower than the observed incomes. Um, you know, most of these actually look pretty good, or, you know, so there's nothing here that would make me think, oh, I need to investigate that variable more, like there seems to be something weird going on. Um, you know, they, they seem to follow generally the same sorts of patterns. So that's the sort of thing. You know, it's, it's very loose, but just the sort of thing you want to look at. Um, the other, this sort of says what I've already said, um, so then, for example, at a very basic level, you can just look at the means before and after. Um, so this slide shows um, the means before and after for some of the variables in our PRAMS data set. And actually, what, I mean, what's actually quite interesting in this data, well, I will comment on this in a second, most of the means are quite similar. You know. BMI, 24.97, 24.97. I will point out that BMI had almost no missingness. So it's not surprising that the mean doesn't change very much. Um, income had 20% missingness. And you can see a shift where um, afterwards, again, people seem to have lower income on average. So that's where you might want to say, well, what do I know about the missingness? You know, And you might see, oh, right. People with missing income tended to live in this part of the city, or they tended to be um, have lower levels of education, and so it's not surprising that they might then also have lower income, and this difference is simply correcting for those differences. Make sense? 
Um, I, I have a question. Could you go back to the um, map that was the, the – not the map, what am I saying? <laughs> the slide that had the – yeah, that one. Um, this one that says Matt did, the one on the upper left-hand corner. Yep. What's going on there? I noticed that you have, like, the imputation that's really high, and then there's some that's really low. So – Yeah, you, that – so this might be an example – where right actually this is a good this is a good place to point this out this is a, an example where the imputations are very variable right that like sometimes it's low sometimes it's high um, in contrast um, income for example the red lines go together pretty well right um, what's probably happening here is basically and this is one of the nice things about multiple imputation What's probably happening here is that we don't have very good predictors of this variable in the data set. So in our imputation, there's essentially a lot of noise. That it, it's, it's trying to predict, I'm actually blanking on what this variable is, but it's trying to predict this variable given the other variables in the data, and essentially the R squared for that model is low. So when creating the imputations, there's just a lot of variability. And this is what is sort of nice about multiple imputation in the sense that it accounts for the information that you have on a given variable in the data. So again, for example, income is fairly stable. The red lines are all pretty much together, which implies that there are probably other variables in the data set that give a lot of information about income. And so our, impu our, our imputations are pretty stable. They don't vary a lot across imputed data sets. Um, but again, other variables like this MATDAG um, are ones where we don't, where we have, we're just much less certain, and so there's more variability. This is also, I'll actually make this point now on the slide, I think it's a good place to do it. This is also why it's hard to give a threshold for what percent of missing values is sort of too high. Um, you know, for example, for income, it looks like we have pretty good predictors. Again, maybe things like education level or, um, you know, race or, you know, gender or some other variables in the data might be very informative about income. And so even if we have a lot of missingness on income, we can kind of fix that. We, it's not a big deal. You know, another sort of example of that in, in educational context is baseline test scores and follow-up test scores. Even if you have high missingness at follow-up, baseline test scores are highly correlated with follow-up test scores. And so you can actually get pretty good imputations. Um, in contrast, a variable like MATDEG, we might, there's just much less information in the data. Um, and so the imputations are more variable. There, later, at the very end of the slides, I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but I'll just mention it now. There's a concept in the statistical literature called the fraction of missing information. And that's what that concept captures, is this idea of of how much information do we have in the data about a given variable. Um, and that's really the crucial sort of quantity. It's not what percentage of values are missing that's sort of crucial. Does that help? OK, so let's assume that we're happy with these imputations and we're going to move on to data analysis. Um, so here, um, Again, I mentioned already, the idea basically is the analysis is run separately in each data set, and then the results are combined using these combining rules. Um, and in the middle of the slide here, I mentioned, um, you know, various packages have automated ways of doing this. You know, in M+, for example, you just give it the multiply imputed data, and it will do all this for you. Um, I think I'm going to skip, you know, I know we're sort of approaching, it's like 4.30 already. Um, so I think I'll skip these details. The next couple of slides just give the math formulas behind these combining. And it shows, I'll just talk through it quickly, This the Q is like the, the quantity itself. So, for example, the re regression coefficient. And this is just saying that the sort of summary regression coefficient is just the average of the ones from the M imputed data sets. Uh, the variance, then, is this T, and this is where we kind of use the within data set variance. And then also the second term, the B term, reflects the variability across data sets. So again, that's what kind of captures the fact that 
we may have a lot of variability across data sets um, in our effect in our estimates. And and so our and again, so that the second term is what makes multiple imputation different from single imputation and what makes it yield standard errors that are actually correct. Okay, so let's um, now talk through this, uh, the results uh, for this um, small for gestational age analysis. I want to really highlight that you should not leave here taking any of these results as actually informative about this association. This was purely a, a illust illustrative for sort of demonstrating these imputation approaches. If I was really going to look at the predictors of small for gestational age, there would be you know, we would do it more carefully in terms of model selection, et cetera. This is just a sort of quick, simple thing. So first I want to show, this is a complete case data analysis. So this is, um, we use the survey package just to account for the PRAMS complex survey design. But other than that, this is what you would do if you were essentially ignoring the missing data. You can fit a logistic regression of small for gestational age on a whole bunch of predictors. This is the output, you know, standard logistic regression output. Um, I will point out the total PRAM sample, uh, we'll see on the next slide, is 1436. This analysis only uses about 900 because about 500 people had missing values on at least one of the variables in the model. But, you know, it runs, we get coefficients, et cetera. The next one um, just does a single imputation. And so um, what we did was we actually did multiple imputation, but then just used one of the data sets. So it sort of would, you know, if you had done just a single imputation, what would the findings be? Um, and, you, you know, again, it looks the same as this previous slide, except that the number of observations is now the total, 1436. And I'm going to talk through this more in a second. I'm just running through it quickly. Um, then the third one, runs the model on our multiply imputed data. And I want to point out a couple things. First is that the analysis command is exactly the same as it was, except we now just have to put in this MI estimate in front. So that's what tells it, look, this is multiply imputed data. You know, run this survey logistic regression, but on the imputed data. So it's very easy to just do that instead of the rest of the command. The second point I want to make is that the output looks like normal regression output that you're used to looking at with, you know, coefficients, standard errors, p-values, confidence intervals. You know, it, the columns are the same as they were on the previous slide. It gives you a, a little bit more information up here. You know, it tells you the number of imputations, the number of observations, so you can sort of check and make sure it's doing kind of what you think it should be doing. But, you know, basically, you, will be, you can interpret it just as you would have um, you know, had you not had any missing data at all. So I want to sort of talk through this a little. Again, the complete case drops almost 30%, um, which, of course, is not ideal. Um, I, I want to point out that, um, so if you, we're not going to have time to do it now, but if you compare the coefficients and, say, the p-values across these three runs, you'll see they vary a little bit. Um, some of them, for example, shoot, I can't see it because of um, the vaginal, oops, you probably lost my slide again, huh? Just a sec. Okay, sorry, it should be back. Um, the vaginal delivery variable, for example, changes from significant to not. It varies a little. Um, I do want to stress that sometimes the results won't change. You know, you'll do this and you'll find, oh, wow, I get the exact same conclusion I would have had I not, had I just done complete case. Um, but sometimes they will change. And I want to highlight that you don't know if they're going to or not until you do it. And you really should trust the imputed results more because of the problems with, sort of, with some of the other approaches that I discussed earlier. Um, and, in, and I also wanted to highlight that if you compare the standard errors, you'll note that in the single imputation slide, the standard errors are smaller than they are in the multiple imputation, and uh, but they're smaller in a way that's wrong. <laughs> they're, they're sort of smaller than they really should be. So you'd be sort of thinking that you have more precision than you really have. 
Um, okay, I'm going to skip this, which is just a different um, way of running that. Um, I think I'm just going to take a few more minutes to kind of run through the, the rest of the slides just to sort of orient you. I mean, we've sort of covered the start to finish of, of how to do multi imputation, what it is, how to run analyses on imputed data. Um, most of the rest of the slides then just go into more complexities and such. Um, and I think I knew I was not going to be able to get through them all, and mostly I'm giving them to you so that you have them as a resource. Um, so, for example, um, you can look at this later, but there's the combining rules that I've talked about are very nice and easy for things like regression coefficients. It's harder to combine things like, like likelihood ratio tests. So there's just this nice table that sort of summarizes the things that are easily or non-easily combined. So you can use this as, as re a reference later. Um, again, I want to highlight this is from this white 2011 paper. If you only read one paper after this webinar, I would really encourage you to read this one to get more information. And, and it's just very practical. It's a really nice sort of overview of the issues. So um, there's a bunch of frequently asked questions. I think I've actually kind of talked through a lot of these already. So um, you can look at them in more detail later. Um, I'll highlight just a couple. One is um, some people are concerned, well, what if the imputation model is wrong? Um, and basically, you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, there's a lot of evidence that sort of as long as you're in the ballpark, it's okay if you don't have, like, exactly the right model. Um, and, again, okay, we talked about this of, you know, is there guidelines for how much missing this is too much? Um, and the answer is no. And, again, that's basically because it's really this fraction of missing information that's what's important. Um, we talked about the scale. I think. Okay. Um, so then there's the next few slides. The next few slides talk about particular data structures that might lead to complications. For example, multi-level data, um, where honestly there's not a lot of great guidance um, in terms of best practices. You can read this if you're curious. Um, at a minimum, you know, if you have, for example, individuals clustered within sites, you probably want to include site indicators in the imputation model, um, and maybe even like site by characteristic interaction terms. Um, I think I'll skip the causal inference one because it's a little bit complicated, but you could read that later if you're curious. Um, those are sort of other so. I'll sort of conclude with sort of these overall points. Um, again, missing data can have serious implications for analyses, especially if the people with missing data are different from those without. Um, and you, you, you basically have to make some assumptions about the missingness and the missing values. So the best approach, of course, is to minimize the amount of missing data up front. Um, you know, there's some saying, I forget exactly what it is, but you know, smart statistics can't always fix bad data. Um, so, you know, it's best if you can sort of, maybe it's, people should say it the other way, good data trumps good statistics or something that, you know, if you can get the data, it's better <laughs> to do that. Um, and, but then, beyond that, it really helps to have a good understanding of the missing data process. So, you know, in the depression example I talked about earlier, you know, getting, maybe doing some follow-up interviews with some of the people who originally didn't respond and getting some sense for, well, are the missing people different from the observed ones, you know, in, in these ways? Like, what is the story? What is, the, what is really going on? Um, so now just a little bit on the, on the details of what we talked about. So the benefits of waiting is that if you do have sort of simple missing data patterns like attrition and non-response, Waiting is pretty easy to implement, to implement and allows you to then make inferences about the original full sample. Um, benefits of multiple imputation is that it's, it is much more general for a more general set of missing data scenarios. Um, you can use these auxiliary variables to improve imputation. So again, maybe variables that are not in your actual analysis, but that might help improve the imputation. Um, 
So sort of my overall take-home lessons are if you have just a very simple attrition problem, you know, people are in the data set or they're not, use non-response weights. Um, but if things are more complex and you have um, item non-response, if the rates of missingness are low, like 1% to 2% for each variable, um, you know, probably just doing a single imputation is fine. Otherwise, I like mice as a multiple imputation procedure um, because it's very general and flexible. Um, again, with either approach, you know, in the end, you may not, you may find that you get the same conclusions, but you'll know that you've handled the missing data in a much better way and have more confidence in your results. Um, and again, either approach, weighting or imputation, will allow you to make statements about the whole sample, not just about the respondents or those with complete data. Um, I, I think I'll, these are sort of just some final tips on using multiple imputation, but I think that we've covered them um, already. So just um, a couple minutes on um, to show you what's in the rest of the slides. One nice thing about multiple imputation is that for some reason there's a lot of very useful tutorials and stuff online. So um, this page by um, Steph Van Buren lists all the software available for creating multiple imputations. And this Horton and Kleinman paper in this appendix gives sort of snippets of code for a whole bunch of different packages. Um, a few packages that I will highlight are um, the MI package for R, um, and the other PDF that Ashley sent out has sample code for this package, so you can see the details of how it works. I like it because it, it works well, it's very flexible. Um, it also has a lot of good diagnostics. Um, the other thing that you all might appreciate is that, um, it's, so it's being developed by Andy Gelman and Jennifer Hill and others, and one of their goals is to make it basically completely user-friendly in the sense of having it handle complexities sort of automatically for you. Um, so you sort of just send it your data and it sort of knows how to model things and it sort of does things very much for you without you having to do very much. Um, so they're sort of still in the process of finishing all of that, um, all of those sort of nice automation, but um, they're a pretty good way, that, good way there, and it's um, a, a nice package to use. Um, MICE is another one that's common in R um, that sort of does similar stuff, so sort of skip it. Um, this is how to analyze multiply imputed data in R. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, so for SAS, again, I mentioned there's IVEWare, which creates multiple imputations. And the, the Stewart and the Azer papers I mentioned earlier talk about IVEWare in much more detail. Um, in SAS, you then can analyze multiply imputed data using their PROC MI analyze command. Um, and then again, Stata has this ICE package, and uh, the, the MI, I guess it's Stata 12 where it started. The MI package that sort of handles is sort of a general missing data package um, is sort of linked with ICE now. That was not true before Stata 12. Um, so this is just some details on how to run ICE in Stata. Um, one other note, this, um, if any of you don't know about the UCLA Statistics um, Department website that has sort of um, software help, it's an amazing resource. <laughs> um, they have great sort of uh, in-depth tutorials where they show code and output and talk you through it. So um, that's what some of these links are, um, and they're just really useful. In fact, that's sort of how I learned <laughs> some of uh, what I've learned about missing data. Um, I'm going to skip these details. Um, SPSS, I'm, I don't know as much about it, but at least in theory, it does have a way of, of implementing MICE using their add-on missing values package. Um, it seems pretty good. Um, I just haven't used it myself. I'm not an SPSS user. But it, um, it seems to be a reasonable package. And then the end of the slides is, again, just more references for you to go. Um, a couple sort of overall web pages. Let me just highlight a few. This Ender's book is a nice sort of fairly accessible book um, on missing data. It covers imputation as well as the maximum likelihood stuff. 
A lot of the other books um, are more technical, more for a statistical audience, um, but the Enders one is, is nice and, and quite accessible. Um, and then I just want to highlight, um, again, that this, ah, you probably lost my slides again for some reason. Let me. Okay. Um, I want to highlight the Graham 2008 paper. It's a really nice one. And um, um, where the Horton and Kleinman on page, slide 97 is also um, very accessible, and they have, again, software and code. And then this white on slide 98, the white 2011 is a really good one. So those would sort of be like maybe the three papers that I would uh, direct you to for more information. The rest of the references sort of have particular topics, like references for weighting, not missing at random models, um, diagnostics, and then sort of some other other random ones. Some of my some of my favorites. So um, I hope that was not too overwhelming. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions, so um, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. If anyone's left. Yeah, well, no, it, it seems like um, in practice the rule of thumb is really if you have a missing, overall missingness rate of less than 5%, it doesn't really matter what you do, even if it's complete case or yeah. missing indicator. But when you're getting closer to 5% and beyond, you really need to, to do the multiple imputation. Um, but I know that you're you were actually saying one or two percent. I just if if it's I agree with that advice. If it's if every variable has more like four or five percent, then I'd be getting nervous. So that's sort of because you know there's there's sort of two things going on. There's there's percent on each variable, and then there's like the number of variables with missingness. So that's sort of you know I guess I I just yeah again. I, if I'd be okay, okay with every variable having one to two percent, uh, if every variable had four or five percent, I would think maybe it's time for like a multiple imputation. Partly just because then, if you did say complete case in that scenario, by the time if you had ten variables in your model, it's possible your sample size would actually be pretty low. You know, even if any given variable only has five percent missing, once you put a lot of variables in you might be losing actually a good chunk of your sample. You know, I've seen cases where each variable had less than 5%, had like say 4% missing, but in, then in a model we lose 20, 25% of our sample. And that's, that's what I would try to avoid. Yeah, I think I'm mostly referring to like a cumulative missing rate. Oh yeah, so if, if the cumulative kind of is 4 or 5%, I, yeah, I think it's probably not really gonna matter what you do. <laughs> If it does matter what you do, I might be sort of nervous about the results in general, that they would be pretty sensitive to um, small changes to the analysis. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I had one, but it went out of my head, so now I have to wait till it's I guess, do we want to uh, end here if there's any questions? Sure, I think we can pull the plug. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I think we all learned a lot about the nuances of, of missing data and what the strengths and limitations of the different approaches are. Um, and we have lots of resources to go to, to to learn more about the different software packages and how to, to really implement it. So thank you so much for all the, the extra resources. You're welcome. Very welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks all. a lot, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.